everyone sing with us, amen? amen. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know he holds the future. It's been a true uh, blessing and a joy to have Brother Madrin. So, Brother Madrin, come and preach for us. Okay, please open your Bibles tonight to the book of 1 Corinthians and chapter 13. Now, Brother Johnson, you're going to have a Hassle of stories to tell about this event <laughs> when we meet on that 50th golden anniversary. Here. <laughs> Brother Kent's not taking notes, he's recording. <laughs> oh my, it's so good to be with you. You know, this is going to be all over with and done before we know it. I can't believe it's been 25 years, and uh, you know, it's, uh, it seems like with those of you that I know. Uh, have known for quite some while that uh, Brother Johnson, for instance, uh, I don't know exactly how many years it has been, but I've been acquainted with Ken, it seems like forever. He's the kind of fellow that first time that I met him, I liked him. Now, that's unusual. And, uh, no, I don't mean that uh, it's, he's unusual. I mean, it's unusual for me to meet somebody I like him just that quick. But Ken's the kind of fellow, at least I found that from the moment I met him, uh, I just liked him, and it seems like I've known him as long as I can remember. Now, I go back a little further than uh, Brother Eddie, but my hair isn't gray yet, and his is a little grayer than mine. But uh, Brother Eddie and I met, actually, when we were just very young, before I was a pastor, but I did before you were a pastor, you used to come down to Grace Baptist Church in those early days, unless my memory is foggy. Uh, we were back there back in 1964, and it seems to me like a young... A uh, fellow on his way up by the name of Eddie Lasco used to come down and speak for Brother Hall uh, on occasion. Remember Brother Gary McCartney that was out of your church? Uh, Brother Gary is uh, the one who influenced me to pick up a guitar and play it. I do okay by myself. I just can't play in crowds. And uh, uh, when Gary McCartney came down, and I'd only been saved a short while, sitting on the front pew of Grace Baptist Church, and uh, I had a burden on my soul because... Uh, I'd been filled up, I wanted to do something, didn't know what I could do, and Gary came down there and strung an old flat top guitar around his neck and began to thump on it, and I sat there and I looked at him and I said, man, I can do that. And uh, shortly thereafter, I got my guitar down and I learned one song, Let the Lower Lights Be Burning, and the Brother Jim Hall and I went to Front Street Mission in Wilmington, Delaware, and I stood up before those street folk and took out that old guitar and began to plunk and sing that. And uh, I ain't got over it yet. <laughs> my soul. And uh, now anybody knows me will tell you that I'm no musician. But I'm working at it and I'm trying to be. Uh, I'm so thankful that so many of you came out this week. Uh, it would have broken my heart not to see some of you. Uh, I mean that. I was looking for Juanita and the Farlow family. And I was looking for Edna and uh, Anna and... Uh, I'm still looking for Diane and Bobby and some of the rest of them, but uh, it thrilled my heart to see Alice and uh, so many, and this dear brother here on the front uh, uh, pew, ordained a deacon and now a pastor, and uh, Brother Ray is also pastoring now up in Reading, Pennsylvania as well. Uh, God has been very good to us over the years and allowed our paths to cross with some wonderful, wonderful people. We have laughed together, but we have cried together. Our hearts have been broken together. We've weathered the storm, but folk, here we are, and we're still uh, standing by the stuff, uh, keeping on, keeping on for the Lord Jesus Christ, because it's real. If you're here tonight, folk, and you're not saved, 
Uh, you may think this is chaos, but we're having a good time. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you ought to get on board. If you haven't received Christ as personal Savior, uh, you need to walk this aisle tonight and ask Him to come into your heart and save your soul and make you part of this wonderful family of God. Now, I was a little long-winded last night. Uh, Brother Ken, but they dared me. They took the clock down. Uh, I've been watching that clock, and uh, I, 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 I learned uh, by preaching on the radio and speaking at pastors' conferences uh, that uh, if you don't watch that clock, you're going to get in trouble. And I learned uh, how to break it off on time. But last night, uh, they took down the clock, and the folks said, we don't care how long you preach. Now, that's dangerous when you say that to an independent Baptist preacher. Uh, and so uh, you got just what you deserve. But I felt so guilty today that uh, I, I, I said, tonight I'm going to be brief. Uh, so uh, we'll preach under an hour this evening. I'm looking at the clock as I speak. I just want to read uh, three verses of Scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The Bible says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or as tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. For those of you that are familiar with this portion of Scripture, you know and understand that the word charity, as used here, uh, really means love. And so Paul is here speaking on the subject of love. Uh, it's not something that you hear too often uh, from the pulpit when A.R. Madrin is preaching, but it's one of the greatest needs, I believe, of our day in the churches and in the lives of God's people. Uh, we've gone through some very deep waters in the past years, my dear wife and I together. Uh, uh, we're never far from tears in these days of trial and difficulty. But if there is one thing that sustained us, and if there is one Amen. thing that kept us, of course, our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but folk, the love of God that was filling our soul, the love of our Savior, and the love that was expressed by our friends and by our family members meant more than I could ever tell you. You'll never know what a smile can do. You'll never know what a warm handshake can do. You'll never know what a warm embrace can do or a kind word can do to an individual that is hurting. Today we are living in a world that is filled with people Amen. that are hurting. Uh, I'm not Amen. going to deal with the controversial issues and that sort of thing. There's one thing that I want to do with the remainder of my days. Now, I served the Lord Jesus Christ from the day that God saved me when I was only 18 years old. I've been preaching now for almost 32 years, but I want you to know that I made a recommitment to the cause of Christ. The devil had me believe that I was getting old and I was getting decrepit and my body was breaking down and that I was sickly and old-fashioned and the kind of ministry that I had was just not for this enlightened age in which we live today. And uh, so I thought it was time to uh, throw in the towel. You know, in most armies, after you put in 20, 25, 30 years, uh, uh, you can muster out on retirement and set back and take it easy and live out the the uh, golden years, so to speak, of your life. But I found that in the army of the Lord Jesus Christ, that that just isn't possible. Uh, you can try to do it, but Jesus isn't going to let you do it. But I have a new zeal and a new fervor and a new burden upon my heart, and that is to spin and be spent anew for the Savior and to share the love that God has filled my soul with and that I've experienced down through these years of time at many and varied occasions. I know the love of God when you're on the mountaintop and when everything is going well and when your family is around you and the refrigerator has food in it and the automobile has gas in it and the closet has clothes in it and I, I know what it is when those things are lacking uh, to Amen. still be sustained uh, by the love of God. It's consistent and it's always there. Amen. Now Paul was writing to a group of people that were in the midst of difficulty. 
Many years ago, Brother Kenny, the only time that I have ever spoken in your church, I spoke from some text in 1 Corinthians, and I just completed a year and a half of studying that book. And uh, I begin to speak of the matter in which Paul uh, greeted these people. And in the first several verses of chapter 1, uh, he told them how much he loved them. He told them how much he cared for them, how gifted they Amen. were, and how blessed they were of God. But from those early greetings, he proceeded uh, to deal with difficulties that existed in Corinth. And page after page after page after page, uh, as Paul is speaking to them, he's dealing with problems. I didn't get hardly any way through what I needed to say. I preached about 35, 40 minutes. He wouldn't let me go any more than that. Uh, but when I got through, Brother Johnson promised me. He said, now when we have about a month's spare time, I'm going to have you come back and uh, let you finish that sermon. Uh, it's been uh, all of these years. We haven't done it yet. And here he is. And here I am again in the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, uh, but uh, I do preach from other births. It just worked out that way. But uh, Paul was writing to a people that were in the midst of tremendous difficulty. He had spent about one and a half years uh, of his life and ministry uh, there in the city of Corinth, and uh, God had used him uh, to establish a tremendous work. Now, bear in mind, in Paul's day, uh, they didn't only meet uh, once a week or twice a week or three times a week, and uh, Paul wasn't limited to a half hour or 45 minutes or an hour of preaching. And preach for hours, and I think this is one of the reasons why that he was able to do the great works that Paul was able to do. But as he begins to speak, he, he begins to deal with many and various difficulties that existed in that assembly. There was division, there was carnality, there was controversy. They were going to law with one another, and uh, they were having problems as far as spiritual gifts were concerned. Now, there are many things that God has given unto you and I as children of God, the greatest of which is salvation. Amen. I was saved by grace through faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is the crowning jewel of God's mercy unto me. But folk, when God saved me, he did more than give me eternal life. He gave me a home on heaven's shore. He wrote my name down in the book of life. He made me a member of the family of God. He made me a member of his body, the local assembly. And folk, God gave me some extras that I didn't even know existed. Uh, I was very content to sit on a pew and listen to my pastor speak and preach uh, for a while. But eventually there was a moving in my soul and I wanted to do something. And so uh, I found out that I could push a broom for the glory of God. I found out that I could paint a building for the glory of God. I found out that I could play a guitar for the glory of God. A Sunday school class opened up and I found out that I could teach a class for the glory of God. I could drive a bus for the glory of God. I could go knock on doors for the glory of God. And then God uh, uh, led me to begin to preach the gospel. And I found out that there was something else that I could do that wasn't there in the earlier days. Uh, God has given gifts unto men. I shared to the church last evening that in uh, the last eight or nine years, uh, I'd gone through at least seven major operations uh, and nearly died on two occasions. Uh, plus, we have lost our only son, went into financial ruin, lost my home, uh, and nearly every possession that my dear wife and I have owned. I've seen her weep and cry and suffer to where I just wish that Jesus uh, would have come down and taken uh, her and I to be with him. And yet, folk, during that period of time, God began to speak to my soul, and my soul was in such tune with him that more than 1,100 songs uh, flowed through my heart and uh, uh, through this hand and onto paper in praise and adoration and glory to my God. Uh, 
uh, yeah, we have lost literally just about as much as an individual could uh, lose and still be living. Uh, and yet I'm going to tell you there's still a fire in my soul. There's still a love in my soul. And there's a reality that all of these things are true. When I began to speak about problems, uh, I'm following in the steps of many other men, even such as Paul. As Paul began to speak to these people of the problems that they were going through, he was an individual that had experienced him as well. But he was talking in chapter 12 about spiritual uh, gifts, and they were a gifted people in many ways. Although they were carnal and there were divisions among them, yet the Corinthians were a very gifted uh, people. Now, in chapter 13, Paul begins uh, to set some priorities uh, as far as Christian uh, uh, gifts and principles and such things are concerned. And here he begins uh, uh, to deal by drawing some contrast with some of the outstanding uh, uh, gifts that have been given uh, and the one thing that is above all else, and that is in dealing with the subject of love. Now he says in verse number one, that though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become as sounding brass or as tinkling cymbal. Now, Brother Shalfon, let me ask you for your permission. Can I take this jacket off? It was uh, very warm when I left Florida. Uh, I, I was coming into the cold, frigid north, and I thought that you'd need a wool jacket. Uh, and I find that uh, this thing, I'm just about to burn up, and you could turn the lights off, and I'd still be melting. And so please pardon me for being undignified. I learned that from Brother Johnson many years ago. Uh, but I asked permission first from the pastor, uh, as a rule, usually before I do that. But uh, the uh, beginning of this particular verse is something that every soul winner ought to give heed to. It's something that every Sunday school teacher ought to give heed to. And it certainly is something that every pastor and every singer ought to give heed to when they begin to think about an endeavor for Jesus and service for the Lord. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. You know, sometimes when an individual speaks, the blessing is not in uh, uh, how literate they are or how accomplished they are or how polished and educated they are. But uh, for the most part, it's more in uh, how much of the love of God is filling uh, the thing that they're saying. Uh, nowhere is that more true than in the realm of music. Now, I appreciate a beautiful voice and I appreciate a tremendous talent. And now through the years of time, it has been my privilege to sit at the feet of many individuals who were marvelously gifted by God in the realm of music. But folk, I'm going to tell you, sometimes uh, the professionals leave you cold and empty and lagging. Uh, and the poor sinner saved by grace could get up and uh, having no training and no real talent or ability. And yet from a heart of love and sincerity, began to sing. Uh, and God take that thing and take Amen. it to your heart and seal it in a marvelous way. Now, uh, this idea of speaking with tongues was an issue at the uh, uh, church at Corinth in that day. And when I think about that, there are two things that come to mind. And the first of uh, uh, which is a problem that we had to deal with here on the eastern shore when I came here. And we began the Baptist Bible Church. Uh, in those days, it was Baptist Bible Mission meeting uh, in a little storefront in a somewhat of a novelty. Uh, back in those days, and folks began to come uh, from everywhere and come into the assembly. And Brother Jimmy, you had to be careful back then when you opened up the floor for testimony. More than one time in that little storefront uptown, uh, we would open the door for testimony, and someone would get up in about the middle of their conversation. I would have to say, now, please just stop right there for a moment. Well, I appreciate what you're saying and your sincerity, but this is an independent Baptist mission. We don't believe that, and uh, uh, you're going to have to sit down. You're not going to propagate that here. I remember one young man came in there one night, and this boy began to speak, and he, he looked like a fine, clean-cut young fellow, dressed well. 
and he wanted to give a testimony and he got up and everything went well until he got to the point that he was running down Main Street in Salisbury beginning to disrobe as he ran. And uh, as he did, about halfway through, I brought him to a halt. We set him down. He didn't come back in those days. But another issue that was taking place at that time and splitting many of the churches uh, was this matter of tongues. And uh, many of you know what I'm talking about, and many of yes, you have do. lived through it. There's a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to the matter of tongues. Now, let me make this clear that the word that is rendered here, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, it simply has reference to languages, yeah. my friend, and yeah. uh, there's no question about that. Now, you bear with me. I'm an independent fundamental Baptist uh, uh, believer and preacher, but I want you to understand folk, there was a gift of languages in the Bible, and it's lifted in the, the gifts of the Spirit in Amen. chapter 12. Amen. But it was not this gibberish, unintelligible Amen. utterances that is being propagated in many assemblies today. It goes back to Acts chapter 2 and verses 1 and following, when on the day of Pentecost the Spirit of God descended and uh, uh, clothed in tongues of fire sat upon uh, these believers, and the Bible says they began to speak with other languages. It was not some heavenly language that no one understood, but the Bible goes on to tell us the list of uh, the languages that uh, uh, they were speaking in that particular time. Amen. And uh, they Praise were the languages uh, that people could understand. It was a sign gift to these unbelievers. They were amazed as they listened and heard people uh, witnessing and telling the glorious things of God in their particular tongue. Uh, now here, uh, Paul is talking about that thing. And uh, he, uh, he talks about it in chapter 12. And as he speaks of it, he says, yes, there was a tongue. But if you read this, you'll see in chapter 12 that it was listed as the least of the spiritual gifts. It was not possessed nor exercised by every believer. There were those that were given the gift of pastors and teachers and helps and healings and administration and other things. Uh, and there was the gift of languages and the interpretation of languages. I think that's a marvelous gift. And I'm going Amen. to tell you if that thing was in existence today, I would love to have it. Amen. In my travels, I've run across some uh, uh, folk that do not speak the king's English in uh, southwestern Virginia and, uh, and down in uh, certain parts of Florida. And uh, there were times when I would to God uh, that that gift were still in uh, in uh, exercise. If it were, I could say, And now I'm not speaking in a heavenly language, folks. That's Chinese. That's a, I used that on my Pentecostal friends. I pulled that on a boy one day, and I thought he was going to die. Uh, and now if there really was a gift of uh, uh, tongues and interpretation, somebody could pop up and tell me what I just said, and then Brother Johnson could lay some Hebrew and Greek on you, and you could uh, tell him what he was saying as well. Uh, listen, uh, there was a gift, it existed, and God used it, and it was a marvelous gift Amen. at the time that Amen. God gave it. But folk Paul said here that although he recognized it and recognized the importance of it, he's saying there's something that's far more important uh, than this particular gift to communicate. I'll tell you another thought that comes to my mind when the Bible says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. I think not only of the gift of languages, but I think of one's oratorical abilities, the blessed gift of communication. Now, Amen. Uh, all men, most men can communicate in one form or another. But folk, you know as well as I do that there are some individuals that are uniquely gifted of God. I mean, they are intelligent, they are articulate, Amen. they are charismatic, and when they begin to speak, it's like listening unto a beautiful song, gifted men that are able to paint word pictures. I don't know where in the world that saying ever uh, came to me, or where I heard it, uh, but many, many years ago, when I was pastoring here, 
Uh, I had a buddy by the name of Downey Ray, Amen. and uh, Downey was Amen. as close to me as a brother, one of the greatest friends that I've had in the history of my lifetime. Downey and I used to share uh, our heart's burdens and our concerns, and I remember saying to Brother Ray, uh, Downey, I, I don't want to be the average run-of-the-mill preacher. I want to be the best God wants me to be. Amen. I want you to pray. I want to have a liberty Amen. to communicate the gospel Come on. of the Lord Jesus Christ in every way. But Downey, I want to be able to speak and as I speak to paint word pictures, I mean, when we talk about hell, I want the sinner to see visions of hell Amen. and to feel the heat and smell the sulfur. When we talk about Amen. the glories of heaven and the glories of the throne of God, I want them in their mind's eye to be able to picture the magnificence of his majesty. There are some that have done it. I must say that though I craved it and prayed for it, uh, it somewhat has eluded me. The pastor was speaking earlier and quoting from Proverbs 25, 11, and he says uh, in that verse that a word fitly spoken is as apples of gold in Amen. pictures of silver. Amen. I've never Amen. seen apples of gold in pictures of silver, but doesn't it sound beautiful? <laughs> yes, I it does. orators Amen. that are orators indeed. Uh, Brother Eddie, I would to God. Now, there have been some preacher boys that have come out of Baptist Bible Church, and uh, there have been preacher boys that have come out of other churches. We have uh, pastors on, from our other ministries and missionaries that are on the field today. Uh, most of them, I must admit, however, I've never heard them preach, and uh, they've gone to Bible college and graduated and gone off to the service of God. But I hope that uh, the boys that came out of our ministry are, uh, are just a little bit close to this young fellow that you've got sitting on the pew over here. In my days, I, I listened to about six of his sermons before I came. I think he sent them to me to intimidate me, to be honest with you, because I, I, I listened to them and I tried to get out of coming up here twice because, uh, uh, you know, you folks have been used to some good preaching. But I'm telling you, God gave you a gift when he brought Jimmy Chalfont and his Amen. dear family to the Amen. eastern shore Amen. of Virginia. Amen. He is gifted. He is articulate. He is intelligent. He's charismatic. And he's God's man for the hour. Amen. The pastor, all of that is tremendously important because that there are some is. of us who don't have the looks. And, uh, I mean, we did in our day when, uh, when, when Brother Johnson and I were your age. We had something to say on the eastern shore of Virginia. And, uh, well, of course, we never had your intelligence or uh, uh, whatever, but uh, uh, I have come to realize and appreciate the spiritual gift. And, folks, it's something that I covet. I love to hear a good speaker. Now, Amen. I must admit that I got that desire primarily listening to preachers. Uh, I was so privileged to have been saved back in the day when Oliver B. Green was Amen. still alive. Amen. And I got to hear Oliver B. Green preach in the Big Ten. How many of you folks heard Oliver B. Green in the Big Ten? Wasn't that a blessing? And did, You know, I heard uh, uh, Dr. John R. Rice, I sat at his feet. He said to me one time at the book table, I had my little boy about three years old, and uh, he said to me, he said, now, uh, brother, i tell you what, he said, I've got six daughters. I've always wanted a boy. And I'll treat you any book on the table for that young fellow you have in your arm. 